So Nan Shik is Head of Artificial Intelligence at the Milner Therapeutics Institute at the University of Cambridge. Nan Shik's role is to lead the AI Research Group at the Milner Therapeutics Institute, University of Cambridge. He, is, he has responsibility to develop and deliver Milner's computational research and the AI strategy. He also has an associate faculty position at the Cambridge Centre for AI and Medicine in the same university. The lab, his, lab is developed and, his lab has developed and applied machine learning, statistical and mathematical approaches to pharmacogenetics and drug discovery, strongly focusing on the use of publicly available big data and utilizing experimental data generated on purpose by the partner organizations. Today, Nanship will discuss data-driven computational approaches for identifying novel therapeutic targets and drug repositioning opportunities. So on that, I will hand over to you, Nanshik, and okay. allow you to become a presenter. Thank you. So I hope you can see the presentation mode. Is it correct? Yes, that's looking good. Thank you. OK, so yeah, thanks again. Uh, Mark and also Dan to invite me to this uh, fantastic webinar series. And I'm very happy to share our recent projects on COVID-19. Uh, yes, I think the title is slightly changed uh, and because I, I only have 30 minutes and I just wanna giving a most recent update on our work. So I just wanted to fully uh, use these 30 minutes for this new project. So as you can see, uh, this uh, study is about uh, using the AI and data-driven computational approaches to identify drug repurposing opportunities for COVID-19. So, as you know, SARS-CoV-2 is really a dangerous virus. Uh, and actually, uh, you are now seeing the daily death rate uh, around the world. And uh, this is a nice graph to show the uh, where the kind of the numbers are increasing and which type, which kind of point of the year and which kind of continent. But the key thing is like the, when it just outbreak, uh, there are only nearly 400 daily deaths around the world. But actually at the end of this year, March, uh, there are more than 10,000 deaths uh, reported uh, daily. So this is really serious disease. And as you know, there are many vaccines available, so this is really helping uh, to prevent this disease. But as you know, there are also a number of uh, very uh, tricky uh, variant uh, uh, kind of recently reported. So that actually makes the situation worse every day. So there may be the third wave or maybe there will be uh, kind of, I don't want to having this, but also, but. Uh, uh, there will be maybe the, another pandemic can be happen with some other virus. So anyway, the, there is a certain need to develop a proper therapy for this type of disease. So uh, one of the approach we can take could be the novel drug discovery. But actually what we really wanted to do this is like to uh, respond it very rapidly. So one of the very practical and promising approach could be the drug repurposing, uh, because as you know, the conventional noble drug discovery pipeline really takes a long time, more than 10 years with uh, quite uh, much money. But actually when we took this drug repurposing opportunity, we can shorten the time and also uh, reduce the spending of the money. But also if we can utilize some kind of data driven or AI-based approach, we may further reduce this time and then also the costs. So uh, this is the whole idea why my group is uh, jumping on this, this project and we actually delivered some results. One of the other uh, really good news at the time was there were a lot of uh, groups, actually still there are many groups that are working on this COVID uh, science and actually uh, they provided a lot of uh, data uh, because as you can see now uh, many groups uh, research groups companies they publish the paper in bioarchive plus uh, peer review journal and actually this is the trend in from uh, January 2020 
and just for last year, but uh, still there are a lot of papers are submitting and published in the in the journals and by archive. Meaning we can also having really a large scale of data for COVID. Uh, maybe some of them are from COVID patients, some of them are from cell lines. But anyway, this is really valuable uh, asset for data scientists in COVID-19 situation. So uh, maybe you, you already know, but about the SARS-CoV-2, uh, it does have really long uh, genomic region. It's quite large uh, genome, uh, and actually it survived. Uh, this sub uh, divided into a number of different subgenomic structures. You can see so there are 16 uh, non-structural proteins, and also there are some uh, ORFs and also structural proteins like as many of you know like spike protein could be the very important one but like there are envelope protein and also nuclear capsid proteins so this is the genomic structure and one of the group uh, they are using mass spec to identify 332 directly interacting proteins to SARS-CoV-2 so those are those are the proteins in our body and they are uh, really uh, interacting to the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself when it comes to our body. So you are thinking, uh, sorry for the small font, but actually you can see the uh, full paper uh, from the uh, citation below. But the uh, red diamond at the center of each diagram is the, the host protein. And I'm uh, sorry, the, the, the red diamond are the subgenomic structure of SARS-CoV-2 and little dots uh, surround this red diamond with a, a little connection is the one that are uh, in our body and they are respond to this uh, virus. This is one set we're using uh, in our analysis. And another data set from other group is the uh, differentially expressed proteins. And actually they also using same technique like mass spec, but they using slightly different way. They measured the expression changes over time uh, at protein level. And uh, after the uh, infection, there are four different time points, like two, six, 10, 24 hours after infection time points, and they measured the expression change over time. And actually, this is just like a summary of the paper, but as you can see, there are certain changes in between time and also a certain uh, pattern, like up or down regulation patterns uh, of the proteins. So as you can see, six and 24 hours are the most distinct uh, time points. So we took those two time points in our study. So uh, we uh, started this project with uh, Wu Chang Mei in the two postdocs in my lab, uh, including myself. And also we working all together uh, because we really need to push this work uh, done in a good time frame. So we worked together and we made a hypothesis like, as I said, SARS-CoV-2 come to our body and then that directly interact to those deep proteins. And also there are another set of protein they changing their expressions over time after the infection. So the question was at the time is like then, what could be the possible mechanism that deep somehow control the depth expression changes? So we wanted to know this and we made a hypothesis like the deep protein is the cause and the depth protein is the consequences of the infection. And we wanted to build the hidden layer in between the deep and the depth. Basically we wanted to connect the deep and the depth protein in the biological context. And then we uh, successfully constructed the hidden layer in between the deep and the depth protein. This is protein-protein infection network. And then the next question is how we can systematically uncover the key protein, key pathways in the hidden layer. Not all the protein would be important, but some set of, some subset of them are very important. So we utilize a network analysis to identify these key pathways and then uh, finally, we're using network simulation to identify and simulate first and then identify and predict those possible approved drugs that could be repurposed for this COVID-19. So these are the basic uh, concept for the projects. And actually, when we constructed the protein-protein interaction network for this, uh, we ended up with this very uh, complex network. And actually, that's why we uh, need to using some network analysis to uncover this pathway. So we're using those four different network algorithms for this. And then uh, this is quick uh, one slide that shows why we're using network analysis. Maybe some of you are very familiar because this is a graph 
uh, a knowledge graph uh, a conference, but uh, just a quick uh, idea why we need it. So network analysis is a very uh, handful tool for understanding this kind of very complex network diagram. So for example, at the moment you are uh, looking at the protein-protein uh, interaction network of only 164 proteins. It's already kind of complex. So some kind of algorithm like random work with restart could be applicable in this context to understand the important uh, proteins. So this is looks uh, complicated, but actually what it provides at the end of the uh, uh, training will, is the kind of the scores for each protein, each node of the network. And then this kind of scores actually help us to rank all the protein, 164 proteins in the network, and then that clearly give us which, what are the most important protein and second important, second most important, and also what protein is important than the other, something like that. So this is very helpful. And this is why uh, some of the other uh, engineering field or some even the industrial setting, they're using it. For example, Netflix, they recommend you some new movie for you because you watched uh, movie X, Y, Z. And they're using your watched movie and new movie in each node of the network. And they using the network analysis to predict the most likely uh, movies for you, you you like. And also in LinkedIn, it's same. They sometimes recommend you new contacts and how they do, they using your uh, previous contacts and uh, they run this uh, network analysis and recommend you some new friends. And also Amazon, they recommend some new items, how they do, they is basically same principles. But in our case, we using the proteins as a, as a node, and then we run this network analysis to get this kind of uh, new uh, uh, visualization. So this is exactly same network, same topology as upper, uh, slide, uh, upper part of slide, and this is just in different color of the important key proteins like blue or red. Red is uh, up-regulated and blue is down-regulated, and the, the link, the interaction, also uh, put in color to show the most important interactions. So there are a number of different algorithms, but mostly we're using random work with restart and also between the centrality and degree of centrality and closeness centrality. So as you can see, uh, each algorithm uh, identify some different kind of protein having different characteristics. Something like random work is really good tool to identify some other protein that nearby the protein of your interest. But like between the centrality, as you can see, maybe in the big uh, protein network, there might be number of different sub networks, and then there must be some kind of protein that connecting two different or three different sub uh, protein network. We wanted to know who is a connector. Then between centrality is the one you you need to use, and also degree of centrality. Maybe this is kind of a distal sub network from your protein of interest, but maybe there are some hub gene that play a key role in there, and then degree of centrality could be the one you can use. So as I can say, uh, we're using these four different algorithms and we identify some kind of key proteins. But again, even though we put some colors in this uh, kind of visualization, it's still very difficult to see. So we change, we decide to change the shape of the visualization. So we uh, wanna put into the uh, circular shape uh, a visualization tool. And then there are three main categories. One is a deep protein, depth, and then in between deep and depth, there are hidden layers, as you can see here. And then also each three main category has their subcategories, like uh, deep protein is a subdivided by the, their subgenomical structure. And also the hidden layer, they subdivide by their biological function, like metabolism of RNA, cell cycle, immune system, and others. And then also we did a, uh, a protein subcellular localization study of all the proteins in this plot. And then we identified the location of each protein, and then we put that into the color, like from the nucleus to the all the way to the plasma membrane and extra cellular regions. So this is one. And then the final thing is the most important one, the connection, the interaction between the proteins. As you can see, uh, there are some kind of connections in between the uh, each kind of part of the network. So this is informative to having this way, uh, I mean, present this way and then show it. But it's more important and more useful if you can see 
uh, the two different time points in one slide. The one I just showed you is about uh, six, uh, at six hours. And there are, as I said, there are another net kind of time point that we picked up uh, in this study is uh, 24 hours. Uh, so we made two different uh, network for two different time points. And then there are a number of things that we can discuss, but one take home message is like at the 24 hours, as you can see, maybe already spotted, but like at uh, six o'clock to seven o'clock, there are some kind of huge increase of the interaction between the proteins. This is all about the metabolism RNA, which is really relevant to the virus replication. And also uh, this is quite makes sense. There are some kind of definite increase in uh, NSPA to the uh, virus replication. So this is kind of known uh, non-structural protein of SARS-CoV-1, uh, the previous virus, that NSP8 have a, play, a key role for virus replication. Also nuclear capsid definitely related to replication. So this kind of makes sense. So visually it confirmed the kind of biology, but also uh, we wanna check this with uh, statistics. So we tested the biological function enrichment at two different time points. And the blue is six hours and red is 24 hours. And as you can see on the far left hand side, there are certain enrichment at 24 hours, but not much at six hours. And if you have a closer look on those specific parts, and as you can see, those are all related to viral replication. So again, statistics confirmed these uh, findings in biology. So next question we had was, uh, what could be then uh, promising targets for the drug repurposing, I mean, promising compounds for drug repurposing. So we gathered all the approved drugs uh, in the world, and then we ran uh, the simulation one by one, and then we finally identify some set of the approved drugs for the drug repurposing for COVID-19. So in the end, we identified 200 approved drugs out of nearly 2,000 approved drugs, uh, and then among those, uh, 240 are at the time already in clinical trials for COVID-19. And also for the 30 of those are the ones that are being reported in some kind of research papers or some kind of other uh, re reports uh, that related to COVID-19. So in total, 70 out of 200 are being studied by other group in clinical setting or research setting. So that kind of somehow uh, validate our uh, validity of our work and this is the results. And then obviously the next question was to understand what would be the mechanism of action of those 200 drugs. Maybe of course they have their own mechanism of action in their given uh, area, I mean the approved area when they approve by the regulators, but we wanted to understand that their uh, own mechanism of action for COVID-19 situation. So we just simply looking into uh, their relationship between the 200 identified drugs and their related pathways. We identified 148 key pathways that are related to these 200 drugs. And we just applied very simple uh, clustering algorithm. Uh, as you can see, it's quite difficult to understand and difficult to cluster them in a really informative format. So we decided to using some uh, advanced technique called artificial neural network, one of the machine learning technique. And then uh, now you are singing uh, the, the way we generate the drug pathway association metrics. And as you can see, we just checked all the drugs in all the uh, protein-protein interaction network, and we identified which drugs are more related to which pathway in, in the which part of network. And then we made that as a binary matrix. And then uh, we put that into the training for artificial neural network. And you are now seeing the, uh, the, the uh, quick diagram that will show you how the neurons, artificial neurons being trained in this study. So as you can see on the uh, left bottom corner, there are data points, the red cross, uh, there are a lot of uh, data points from the drug pathway association matrix. And then on the right upper corner, there are artificial neurons uh, there. And then it's been before the training. And when you start the training, uh, now you are singing the, each step of the training. And now it's just past 500. And it's, 
the neurons are fairly well spread over the uh, kind of data points is not quite really fit or cover all the data time points. Now it's past 10, 000, uh, sorry, thousand, and they are now a little bit further up to or further down to other kind of sparse data points. And then after the 2000 uh, training, and it nearly covers most of the data time points. But also, as you can see, there are many kind of artificial neurons are located and find their position uh, in the two uh, data cluster. One is the uh, left upper corner and one is the right down corner. Uh, and as you can see, this is the kind of quick training uh, results. And after this training, uh, this uh, artificial neural network uh, clustered all the pathways and drugs into the, this heat map. So uh, now you are seeing 148 heat maps. Uh, each heat map uh, represents one pathway. And then uh, there are kind of the yellow signal and the black, uh, blue background. The yellows are the where the most strong signal is come out. So, and also the older kind of neurons are in the same position in each heat map. So it's, it's possible to visually just uh, I mean, it's possible to compare the, the each heat map directly. So, uh, for example, uh, you can see some kind of the red, uh, yellow, uh, strong signal at the left bottom corner in this case, those heat maps, and those are more related to cell cycle. They are all same. And also, if you're seeing the the other uh, bottom corner, like the right bottom corner, there are strong signal, then those are tend to have a similar kind of biological function, which is the immune response. And also there are some in the 12 o'clock or on the one o'clock side, like these ones, then those are the ones that related to the metabolism repeat. So this is uh, one of the, the thing we can do uh, with AAN. And then in the end, what it actually gives us is like one really nice clustering of 148 pathways into the nine uh, pathway clusters. And those are the uh, kind of parent uh, cluster terminologies. And then we successfully uh, cluster 148 into nine pathway clusters. And then that helps us to uh, put nine cluster pathway into two main mechanical action categories. One is a virus replication and the other one is an immune response. And finally, the artificial neural network also helps to assign each 200 drugs into uh, the pathways and mechanical action. So you are now seeing the number of drugs that assigned each kind of neurons in the heat map. And then it actually clearly gives us the, which drug could be uh, useful for virus replication or immune response. So actually this is one uh, diagram that summarize all the drug names in each category. Uh, I mean, the mechanism categories or, or pathways. So maybe you can have a closer look in our, uh, our publication. Uh, this is in press, uh, will come out at the end of this month. So uh, that will be available to you. And last part is the kind of validation. But before that, we need to uh, kind of shortlist the validation targets. So uh, we made this uh, kind of quick uh, analysis to understand what kind of the pro most promising protein targets and what kind of drugs. And we eventually identify those are the most relevant kind of functionality for those. And then finally, we shortlist only five drugs to be validated on the bench. So this uh, wet lab validation is done on the collaboration with the Fredman Weber lab in Germany. And then uh, we tested five drugs. And as you can see, the control is here and then there are five drugs and two of them showing really good efficacy and the uh, sub so, uh, cell viability is okay with uh, in this test. So we decided to do further uh, uh, validation with Costas in the Miller Institute. So his group helped us to understand uh, this specific two uh, compounds, proguanin and sulfasalatin in two different cell lines, Vero 6 and Carlo 3. And then we checked their dose response and we confirmed uh, we, it is actually having a really good response. And also we checked with number of uh, COVID-19 biomarkers. And also we confirmed these two drugs reduce the uh, biomarker activities. So we having those uh, results together. And then this is uh, due to the time, I'm, I wouldn't say much, but we identify some kind of uh, more detailed mechanism of action in the paper. 
So hopefully you can see this in the paper. In summary, we're using two different proteomics data to construct the two network in two time points. And then we ran the network analysis to identify key protein in, in, in two different networks. And then we ran the drug simulation to identify 200 drugs. And then we're using ANN to cluster them and identify possible mechanism of actions. And then finally, we done the uh, two wet lab validation for two approved drugs. So I would like to thank my group, particularly Wu Chang and Mei, who uh, put the effort in the project and the funders and collaborators. Thank you. Thank you, Namshe, for a really interesting talk on using knowledge graphs for, for drug repurposing. Uh, really sort of highlights how sort of in silico methods, you know, really valuable in, in drug discovery.